the encyclosphere. Our vision is this. We will convert the content of all the encyclopedias in the world into a standard format. We will make all that data publicly available, either free articles or the metadata about proprietary articles. We will also give you the tools you need to build your own article collections and search engines. Just imagine what programmers could build with access to all that data, kept constantly up to date, as well as some ready-made platform for displaying it. How can we make this vision a reality? My name is Larry Sanger. My claim to infamy is that I am co-founder, sometimes I call myself ex-founder, of Wikipedia. My academic background and first career was in philosophy, but I've spent most of the last 20 years of my career working on nonprofit reference and educational websites. I started a web project called The Encyclosphere. It's not a new encyclopedia. It's an open network of all the encyclopedias. There's a big difference. To support this vision, I got some friends together to start the Knowledge Standards Foundation. This video is an in-depth explanation and progress report about what we're doing and where we're going. I'm actually going to begin by talking about social media. So here we go. Champions of free speech, liberals, conservatives, libertarians, let's talk. People who, 10 years ago, would have been able to speak out publicly without any difficulty are being increasingly censored by the giants of Silicon Valley and by countries around the world. Whether in the hands of powerful multinational corporations or governments, people with controversial and heretical points of view are, like it or not, being removed from the main avenues of public discourse. This is shockingly inconsistent with the principles of free democratic societies, where open, vigorous discourse has been regarded as the lifeblood of a healthy society for centuries. We no longer need to argue about whether big tech might start a program of political censorship. They are very open now about their willingness to wield their hegemonic corporate power to exert political influence and they do that all around the world. And governments use the same technologies to the same ends. And we, ordinary people, are left in a situation in which we have less and less control over our experience online. For those of us who still value a truly open society, what can we do? We could dream about giving big tech the boot, but what can we really do? Open-minded people have built alternative platforms. Alternative social media sites like Minds and Gab have already been launched. Gab's reputation took a hit in its first few years. Parler came online and was effectively shut down for several weeks. They still haven't fully recovered. Getter was promoted as the next standard bearer of free speech conservatism. And, unsurprisingly, President Trump is poised to launch Truth Social, his own free speech social media network. There were also a few liberal alternatives which never quite took off, including Mastodon, the flagship instance of the broader Fediverse network. Of those sites I mentioned, Gab leads in traffic according to Alexa.com. There are also free speech alternatives to YouTube, like Rumble, BitChute, and Odyssey. And as with social media alternatives, not all alternative video sites are explicitly conservative projects. When it comes to encyclopedias, there are many alternatives to Wikipedia. Much of this video will describe a way of networking together all these alternatives. Protecting free speech and providing social media platforms is important work, and I'm grateful to the people behind the many startups doing this work. But there's a big problem with all of them. 
We already know that the strategy of Silicon Valley and the corporate world generally is to capture and control whatever successful platforms come down the pike, or shut out those that refuse to be captured. That's not cool. It leads to more centralization. But it's what we've come to expect from these corporate platforms. You might say, but Gab and Rumble would never sell out. Are you aware that Twitter and YouTube both began as standard bearers of the free speech internet? It's true. Here's another idea you may have already heard about. The only way we can guarantee free speech in the long term is if we stop building centralized platforms that connect everyone to the same giant hub. Instead, start building free and open networks, like the internet used to be, and was originally intended to be. But what does that mean in practical terms? Well, I've started an organization called the Knowledge Standards Foundation, dedicated to dealing with these practical issues. The KSF Incorporated in the fall of 2020. We are working on two projects, and both involve building decentralized content networks. You may be wondering what a decentralized content network is. I'll provide two examples. One is for social media, and the other is for encyclopedias. Let's begin with the social media project. Think about how Twitter works. When using Twitter's website or app, you log in, compose a tweet, hit enter, and off goes your tweet to some of your followers, all controlled by an algorithm Twitter never reveals. The process happens within Twitter's own ecosystem. If you play the Twitter game well, you can get many thousands or millions of followers. But if you leave Twitter, you can't bring your followers with you. If you quit or if Twitter bans you, you have no way to reach out to your Twitter followers. You can export your tweets, but they're pretty much useless outside a system Twitter exclusively controls. And since there is no social media standard in widespread use, you can't easily transfer your account to one of the alternatives I mentioned earlier. Twitter is a centralized system under their full control. And surprisingly, most of the alternative social media and video platforms, like Gab, Getter, and Rumble, are also centralized in pretty much the same way. But it doesn't have to be that way, as I will demonstrate. Google.com, Facebook.com, and Twitter.com are all domain names. Anyone can own a domain name. I own quite a few myself. For example, my blog is LarrySanger.org. I own the domain name. My blog runs on the well-known free software called WordPress, which turns out to be important to our work on social media. So let's talk about it a little. WordPress runs close to 40% of all websites on the internet, quite a substantial number. WordPress began and is still widely used as a blogging platform. But you can control the appearance of your site using themes and plugins, which can basically make your website look any way and do almost anything. The Knowledge Standards Foundation funds a prototype theme we temporarily named Minifeed. Here's how Minifeed version 1 looks after you install it on WordPress. Minifeed converts your blog into a social media feed. Here's my Mini, installed on another domain I own called startthis.org. Here's how I post, hit return, and the site updates. I have a plugin installed that pushes all of my posts from Start This to Twitter. Minifeed version 1 converts the appearance of your blog into a social media feed. We are hard at work on version 2, which will allow you to follow minis owned and controlled by others, who are writing on their own private domains. Minifeed creates a true network of totally independent websites, decentralized and self-owned, 
and having nothing to do with the corporate giants of Silicon Valley. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the rest will not be able to block your account because you'll own your own account on your own website. They won't be able to keep you from following or being followed by someone else. That will be under your control and the control of those you're connected with, as it should be. We are in the early stages of design and various features like notifications will be added as will interactions with other networks, not just individuals. You'll be able to see tweets from Twitter and posts from Facebook and pictures from Instagram all in one united feed, and you'll be able to respond to them all from the same feed. Minifeed will be made available to the public under an open content license when version 2 is finished. Version 2 is currently under development. So let's take a step back. What's the difference between Minifeed and platforms like Gab, Getter, or even Mastodon? Each individual will own and control their own Minifeed on their own website. Individuals will interact directly with other individuals who are also self-owners, and that interaction will eventually branch out to include networks. Minifeed was created for public conversation, just like Twitter or Facebook, but is an independent project, so there is no platform and no private server that could permanently shut you down. You will own your own data and maintain control of your relationships. Even if some giant corporate web host decides to stop hosting you, you can always find another web host and be up and running as you were before you won't lose any followers. There are many hosts that advertise and support free speech. It would be hard to shut them all down. We've been discussing social media, but encyclopedias don't employ user accounts and data in the same way. So can we say that encyclopedias are centralized in the same way that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok are? They are, in fact, in two ways. Google and other search engines push results from Wikipedia at users. Everyone regularly experiences this. Make a general search, get back Wikipedia results at the top of the list. But most encyclopedias are small in terms of traffic. Let's focus on the one that is totally dominant, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the 800-pound gorilla of encyclopedias. It has been in the top 10 or 20 of websites worldwide for over a decade. Britannica, the second-place contender, has much less influence relative to the general public. Wikipedia dominates, and while it used to be the encyclopedia anybody can edit, it is now carefully managed by a band of largely anonymous partisans who have gradually twisted the site's neutrality policy so that articles are neutral only with respect to left-wing news publications and left-wing academia. What makes Wikipedia centralized is the fact that it is not an open network. It is a single website with a systemic ideological bias reflected in its articles. It is only as diverse as its media sources, which are primarily left-wing establishment sources. Wikipedia is owned by a single owner, the Wikimedia Foundation, and managed by a single entrenched group of volunteers who don't accept alternative views or articles that reflect anything but establishment views. They don't like external criticism. Wikipedia is no open network, as it was in its early days, it has become a closed and carefully controlled platform. What if, instead, we made an open network out of all the encyclopedias? That is what we, the KSF, are currently developing, the Encyclosphere. For a rough idea of how it works, let's begin by looking at EncycloSearch, a KSF software project. Version 1 of EncycloSearch is simply an encyclopedia meta-search engine. When you do a search, it visits the search forms of a couple dozen encyclopedias and assembles the results. 
Of course, this isn't a network and not even a regular search engine, which requires collecting all of the text of all of the encyclopedias into a single database and then searching that. This is closer to what Encycler Reader, one of our newer projects, does. It searches its own local database, which contains its own copies of articles. When using this search method, it doesn't have to query encyclopedia search engines to return results, so it's fast. When you click on a result, you see the article, but we're still on Encyclo Reader. In this case, the content comes from Citizendium. Citizendium, Wikipedia, and many other free online encyclopedias use an open content license, which lets anyone republish their content. Encyclo Reader takes advantage of the offer and republishes the content. So, depending on your desire and ability, you could have copies of all the free encyclopedias in the world in one place. That's sort of what we're doing, but there's more to it than that. The KSF is neither building an encyclopedia, nor a platform, nor even a single search engine or encyclopedia reader. Rather, we are building an encyclopedia network. That means writing the software necessary to read and widely share all the free encyclopedic content that can be found online. In the end, we as an organization will not host encyclopedia search engines or readers of our own. We do not want to compete with encyclopedias and encyclopedists. We want to serve them, and more importantly, their readers. We are building the software that anyone can use to make their own encyclopedia search engines and collections, drawing from all of the encyclopedic content online, not just Wikipedia. Ideally, it will always be real-time current. Way cool, but a challenge to pull off. To understand the concept, let's take a look at how Encyclo Reader works presently. This is in the process of changing. Type in a search query, Robert Burns. Encyclo Reader first searches its own locally stored files, and then separately searches external articles using a method like Encyclo Searches. Whenever someone opens a new Encyclopedia article on Encyclo Reader, then behind the scenes, Encyclo Reader saves a copy of that article to the database, and then that copy becomes another article to search. So, as people open more articles, the database gets bigger and bigger. We recognize the flaws in this early version, and we are making improvements. But let me explain how Encyclo Reader stores articles, because this goes to the root of our endeavor. This is where we get into the actual technical standards that the Knowledge Standards Foundation is promoting. Behind the scenes, articles are saved in the form of what are called ZWI files. A ZWI file is a standardized file format. It's actually just a kind of zip archive, with its content taken, or scraped, from a free article on an encyclopedia website. The software that takes an ordinary encyclopedia web page and converts it into a ZWI file is called ZWI Builder. We've also written some desktop software for exploring and editing ZWI files called ZWI Editor. That's what you're looking at right now. Within the ZWI file, there is a self-contained HTML copy of the article with some basic styling. We think it's pretty cool, even if it is of interest mainly to programmers. What is important is what programmers can do with all this structured information. The images and styling data can be found in the Data folder within the ZWI archive. Some of the styling you saw in that HTML file, such as tables, are drawn from the original source page, and some is generated automatically by ZWI Builder for a little uniformity. For purposes of indexing the text, we have a plain text version of the article, too. For articles that started life on wiki pages, we download and save a copy of the original wiki markup. A more lightweight version of the ZWI format is used to index proprietary articles, like those behind paywalls, which cannot be legally shared. Even about those articles, we can still save some useful data, called metadata. 
We use the JSON data format for this. This has the most basic information you need to include the article in a search engine. Things like a title, description, language, time last modified, and source URL. These files would include not the article text, but just a list of what are called significant phrases drawn from the article. A search engine can then index paywalled articles using those phrases. With a standard format, it's easy to make a search engine that indexes a whole lot of articles, some free and some proprietary. I said that there were a whole lot of articles with ZWI files, but presently there are a limited number of articles indexed, about 80,000. We will be generating a lot more ZWI files, not tens of thousands, but millions from all the encyclopedias in the world. How? Well, we've written another script called Encyclocrawler, and we've actually crawled a few whole encyclopedias. Crawling simply means that we systematically visit and store the content of an entire website. Encyclocrawler goes through a whole encyclopedia and stores it entirely in the form of ZWI files. We have done that with a few encyclopedias, and the results can be found in both a new beta version of EncycloSearch, and the articles can be opened and read within EncycloReader as well. I've gone into some detail about this, not to try to intimidate you with technical jargon, but to demonstrate what is under the hood, a standard format for encyclopedia articles, the ZWI format. This is still under active development. To summarize what we have done so far, First, with the ZWI file format, we are introducing and developing a standard that can represent all the world's encyclopedia articles. The ZWI file format does for encyclopedias what the RSS blogging standard did for news and blogs. Second, with a crawler and other tools, we have started converting actual articles and whole encyclopedias into individual ZWI files and whole collections of ZWI files. Third, we have built encyclopedia search engines that quickly search through those collections. So, what are the next steps? First, we will work with publishers to give them new tools to save their articles in this Wii format. If an article changes, these tools will insert the new version into a record of changes, then immediately push the resulting updated ZWI files to the network for anyone to use. The ZWI file format works unobtrusively with all existing publishing systems. This will not require the publishers to change their publishing systems, editorial standards, or styling in any way. Second, all collected encyclopedic data, as well as the software needed to build encyclopedia search engines and readers, will be constantly updated, exchanged, and made publicly available. When this happens, the KSF will stop running its own search engines and readers, but we will continue to support the software that others may install and use for this purpose. Within the next year or two, you'll be able to instantly search through all the English encyclopedias in the world, with other languages soon to follow. The latest versions of all the free articles and the latest metadata about paywalled articles will be displayed instantly. Anyone will be able to write apps based on this data. The world will not be limited to using Wikipedia as their only encyclopedic source. We will have a giant network of encyclopedias, all linked by a common data standard. We expect many kinds of publishers will use the network, including academics, individual developers, giant corporations, little startups, government agencies, and on and on. It will be a free and open network of knowledge. If you stop and think about it, the content of the network we're calling the Encyclosphere has always been available to us. The Knowledge Standards Foundation is simply collecting all that data and making it readily available to the world. It is an open content network. Think of all three words. This is a very powerful concept. The blogosphere pioneered the concept of shareable content, 
within an open body of uniformly defined standards. Blog aggregators collect and make news feeds and blog feeds available to writers, web designers, and developers. It has become an essential part of how news and opinion are delivered today. Well, why haven't we done that with other categories of content? It's a good idea. It's an obvious idea. It's what we should be doing, not just with news and blogs, but also encyclopedias and social media and videos and no doubt other categories of content as well. We need to build the next internet around new decentralized content networks. And when I say decentralized, please don't think cryptocurrency. Decentralization is much older than crypto. The blogosphere did not need crypto or blockchains to make a decentralized network of this sort. All we need is tried and true technology that has been around for a long time. One more big topic to cover, and that is how to keep the networks open, to keep them from being captured and closed by Silicon Valley or other power players. Within the next year, we will be systematically crawling and archiving articles from dozens of encyclopedias. We should make sure that the tools I've discussed, such as Zwi Builder, Encyclocrawler, and the Zwi format, are as we want them to be before we start creating millions of Zwi files. As I will explain, we have already experimented with posting those articles to open data networks. When we are ready, we will devote more resources to this so that anyone will be able to build apps using them. Now, suppose you've written something that could serve as a decent encyclopedia article, and you just uploaded it to your academic web space or blog. Can it be included in the encyclosphere? Yes, of course. We have recently started work on software that will allow people to push their articles directly to the encyclosphere, which, just for now, means to the encyclo reader and encyclo search aggregators. You provide the web address where your article resides, and maybe paste it into a Zwi file editor or a wiki page, then let those programs do the formatting for you. Then you can simply upload the file directly to the encyclosphere in the proper format. Pretty cool. But what if people start pushing a lot of nonsense or spam or other undesirable content to the network? We've thought about that, and it is clear to us that different aggregators will apply different whitelists. Some will be restrictive, others broadly permissive, but it seems unlikely that any will scoop up every ZWI file that is available, since some will be useless on anybody's view. That said, one person's spam is another's useful content, and the network as a whole will be agnostic about which is which. But what if you want to edit the file after it's uploaded? And what if somebody tries to impersonate you? What's to stop them? How do you take control of the file you've uploaded? And in the case of the imposter, how would you prove it wasn't you who uploaded a file in your name? Rest assured, these are serious issues and we're giving them careful consideration. Identity problems are well known all over the internet and are a huge piece of the puzzle that is building decentralized networks. When you want access to the content you own on centralized networks like Google or Facebook, you simply log in with your username and password and voila, only you can edit what you've uploaded to that account. Your account is password protected, so unless you've been hacked, you're the only one with access. And that's fine until Google or Facebook says you can't. And there's the rub. You can only host your content with their permission, which means it's partly theirs. And they can lock you out of your account permanently. These companies have brazenly practiced censorship over the past few years, and that's why so many internet users today are pushing for decentralized networks. We want networks that hand back full control to individuals. But if your content lives on a decentralized network, how do you make sure that only you maintain control over it? This is an old problem, 
with an old solution. Consider a new variant on the old solution. It's published by the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the big internet standards body. It's called the DID specification, or Decentralized Identifiers. One particular implementation of that specification is called DID PSQR. The last bit stands for Public Square. It defines a distributed identity that you can use anywhere in a truly open, truly decentralized public square. The DID PSQR specification works a lot like a system you probably use every day. You know the lock next to web addresses? You might have noticed it. That lock means the website uses the relatively secure HTTPS protocol rather than the older HTTP protocol. If you click on the lock, you're told that your connection to the website's server is secure. That means the website has a certificate, and your browser recognizes that the certificate is valid. That means that you know the information coming to your browser actually did come from where it looks like it came from. In other words, nobody is spoofing the website. Nobody is cleverly impersonating it. So, the HTTPS protocol is an identity system for whole websites. The way this sort of identity system works is a bit technical for the general public, but most programmers understand it. These details really are important. This is something everybody should probably know about, not just programmers. So, let's get into it a little. If you spent much time on a command line, you might have heard of key pairs. This is a pair of codes which fit together in a certain way. In a key pair, one is public. It's typically used for some kind of communication. It operates like an email address or a Twitter handle. You can give this piece of code out to other people. The other bit of code in the pair is private, so it operates like a password that only you have. You keep this secret and safe. Both the DID PSQR specification and the HTTPS protocol are based on something called key pair cryptography. Because of the relationship between the public key and the private key, two things become true. First, I can use my private key to take something I've written and translate it into a mysterious unreadable code. But, because of the way the key pair works, this mysterious code can be deciphered by anyone with my public key. That's the way key pair cryptography works. More specifically, how public and private keys relate to each other. Anyone who deciphered my encoded message would know I had to have written it, because only I had the private key that would encode the message in a way that my public key would unlock. Neat, huh? Well, it's neat if you understand it, and it's very useful when proving that people are who they claim to be. Second, anyone with my public key can also produce a mysterious unreadable code, and nobody could read it, except me, when I unlock it with my private key. That means someone could send me a secret message that only I could read. If I produce the original text, then I've proven that I have the private key. So, what does this key pair cryptography have to do with decentralized identifiers? To reiterate, it is an identity system we're proposing to use for decentralized content networks like the Encyclosphere. Why does the Encyclosphere need an identity system? If a person wants to sign their name to an article they authored, and their personal identifier is like an email address, they add their name and personal identifier to their article. But then anybody could write that on an article and claim to be that author. Not good. What's needed is a trustworthy method of signing the article in a way that confirms it was by the author. How? Well, suppose you run a little cryptography program on your server. The program takes the article, or maybe the whole ZWI file, as an input, and outputs a complex code, which looks like a long password, called a hash. 
anyone could take the same file and run the same program and get the same hash. Next, the little cryptography program takes a second step. It takes the hash as an input and then uses your private key to spit out another code, which only a private key could get from the hash. We could call this second code your signature because only a private key could generate it. It works like the padlock on the website, but what it's confirming is that you authored that particular ZWI file. You add that second code to the ZWI file itself, and it becomes a more reliable signature called a cryptographic signature of your document. But how could you use that signature to prove the author actually signed it? By running another little cryptography program on your own server, it takes two inputs. The signature you added to that ZWI file and your public key. The program spits out the hash of the ZWI file because of how the public-private key pair work together. So you use the author's public key and signature to get the original hash, which we saw previously without using the original ZWI file. But anybody can also get the same hash from that original ZWI file and compare them and see that they are identical. So that proves mathematically or cryptographically that only the author's private key could have produced that signature. I realize it sounds like a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, but here's the bottom line. You can prove to the world that a file that is floating out there online in a decentralized network or anywhere else for that matter, actually belongs to the author because their private key signed it. That matters because then everyone on the network can trust that any future changes to the file should be respected if they come from the author. The public-private key pair can work as your own identity. It will work absolutely anywhere and it doesn't depend on Google or Facebook or Twitter. You can also sign information about yourself and attach it to your identity. For example, I can include a list of the people that I follow. Nobody can edit that list but me. I own it. I can also include a profile picture that only I control. I can add a bio and so forth. How does this identity system work in the context of the encyclosphere? We'll go back to the case of an individual author wanting to upload an encyclopedia article they've written, being able to upload new versions of the article, and making sure no one else takes credit for their work. How does the identity system help with that? To begin with, the KSF will be creating a plugin for WordPress, so if you upload an encyclopedia article to your blog, you'll be able to push the article to the encyclosphere with the press of a button. If you ran a whole encyclopedia, like Ballotpedia, the Encyclopedia of American Politics, and you wanted to put the contents of Ballotpedia on the encyclosphere, how would you do it? The KSF has already converted all the articles in five smaller encyclopedias to ZWI files using EncycloCrawler. So initially, those encyclopedias could use our work. The problem is that the article collections were made just once, and they will get out of date fast. How do we keep the collections constantly up to date? It turns out that under the hood of Ballotpedia is the same software that runs Wikipedia. It's called MediaWiki. The KSF has already released the first version of a plugin, a piece of add-on software for MediaWiki that allows wiki publishers to prepare articles for the Encyclosphere and then upload them right from MediaWiki. Let's break this down a little better. The plugin converts some or all of the articles on your wiki to ZWI files to keep your collection of ZWI files 100% up to date so that they represent the latest versions of your articles. The script will be automatically run every time someone makes a change to an article. It updates the right ZWI files. Next, you need to sign the articles using the procedure I explained above. 
it will help prove to everyone that it was the publisher, not somebody else, who published the article. Ballotpedia will have its own cryptographic key pair, which, as I said, is basically a technical representation of its identity. So, on the Ballotpedia server, the plugin automatically adds a signature to Ebris Wii file. Ebris Wii file will have a different signature, but aggregators, and anyone else who wants to, will be able to prove that every file came from that Ballotpedia identity. Finally, we push the changed and signed ZWI files to the Encyclosphere. That basically means making them available to the world in a decentralized network of encyclopedia articles. Imagine all the encyclopedias were doing that, publishing their own signed ZWI files to the Encyclosphere. Then we could simply make a big long list of all the ZWI files that can be found all around the internet. Someone could assemble a sort of registrar of encyclopedic content, a whitelist or index of acceptable encyclopedias and articles. But of course, since the data is decentralized, there could be multiple such whitelists or indexes. Different services with different interests or standards could publish very different whitelists. There is a name for a service that collects free content and makes it available. It's called an aggregator. For example, there are quite a few different blog aggregators which make blog posts from many different blogs available to users. An encyclopedia aggregator would work the same way. It would collect the contents of many encyclopedias in the form of ZWI files and make them available for various purposes, but mostly just searching and reading. The KSF has started two encyclopedia aggregators, EncycloReader and EncycloSearch. I described them earlier, and their software is being refined now so that others can use their aggregator features. We have commitments from two or three other organizations to run their own aggregators. They would work like this. When publishers, such as Ballotpedia, make changes to their articles, they will probably send automated requests to one or more aggregators to update their indexes. For other encyclopedias which don't change so often, an aggregator might just occasionally check pages in its index and then use Encyclocrawler to check for updates. However the updates are found, they will be included in the aggregator's collection of ZWI files. Finally, those new or updated ZWI files are shared, so they spread from one aggregator to others through data distribution networks. But how will that work? In other words, how do Encyclosphere aggregators exchange their ZWI files in a free, open, well-designed way? There are different existing tools that could be used for this purpose. We have experimented with both the HyperCore protocol, which allows for easy transferring of data between servers, and its predecessor, the DAP protocol, by the same group. We have tested these protocols extensively. Another possible protocol that we have tested is IPFS. This is like a shared but decentralized file storage system. Without getting into the details, this is used a lot in the crypto space, and the costs of hosting content can be, but do not have to be, paid for by a cryptocurrency called Filecoin. Finally, there is the good old BitTorrent protocol, which should work. We have tested this most recently, and the tests are going well. The big advantage of BitTorrent is that it is well known, well supported, and documented, and has been proven to be truly decentralized. As long as multiple servers are making files available on the network, and that's called seeding, the files will stay up and be available to anyone. There is also a handy version called WebTorrent which can be accessed by browsers. Our experiment with these data distribution networks have been very useful. We now understand much better exactly how to use them, and we have come to two conclusions. First, massive amounts of data need to be distributed between aggregators. This cannot happen easily at a large scale by any of the above data distribution networks. Instead, we have developed a prototype network of our own based on direct HTTP connections between participating servers. In other words, we're using the same old decentralized tech the internet itself is built on. 
Using this network, we are currently able to share and reconcile data across four different aggregators. The second conclusion is more tentative. With broad enough participation in the network, it is possible that BitTorrent can be used both by aggregators and by everyone else to distribute files more widely to the general public. To illustrate, suppose a college starts a general encyclopedia basing their software on, let's say, EncycloReader. They want to make a copy of almost the entire encyclosphere but they don't have the programmers or the server resources to host hundreds of terabytes of data, a vast amount of data, which would be required to include Wikipedia and every other encyclopedia site. So here is where both an aggregator and BitTorrent could help. The new encyclopedia could use the aggregator's API to search 100 terabytes of data. That's a lot and then present the search results to its users the way it wants to. Then, when the user clicks on an article, a copy is fetched not from the encyclopedia's servers, but instead from BitTorrent, or in other words, from someone who has a copy of the ZWI file and can provide that copy to the end user quickly. To reiterate without the technical jargon, EncycloReader and EncycloSearch are both being developed as free software that anyone will be able to install. It will allow researchers, students, professionals, corporations, and government agencies to create encyclopedia article collections, both specialized and general, which draw from a wide variety of sources. But they will not have to host all of that content themselves. It will be distributed from many different source points. Our plan is to let editors using this software choose from among encyclopedias, and even among articles within encyclopedias, and present them as one unified resource. In this way, they should, in fact, be able to use the software as the first real alternative to MediaWiki, which has been the go-to software for new encyclopedias for almost 20 years. To submit articles to this new kind of encyclopedia, writers could simply post an article to their own web space and then let encyclopedia editors decide whether or not to include it. In the long run, we will also have a decentralized article rating system, which should spark some interesting competitions to write the best article according to various encyclopedias or groups of raters. I personally am really looking forward to that. This, then, is the general architecture of a new and old sort of decentralized content network. We've already made great headway in the last year in implementing this vision. Most of this work was done by two part-time developers. Imagine what we could do with more full-timers. In any event, by the end of the year, we aim to accomplish this. We should have a basic encyclopedia content network anyone can use and build apps on. There should be millions of articles in the ZWI format in this network. Publishers should be able to sign and push their articles to the encyclosphere. Developers should be able to build branded encyclopedia projects using either EncycloReader or EncycloSearch. Authors should be able to use WordPress and or a desktop app to write and submit brand new articles to the encyclosphere without being part of any encyclopedia. If you support this vision, what should you do? Add your email address on encyclosphere.org for updates. Go to encyclosphere.org slash donate and make a generous contribution. This project will be free forever, but we need your support. If you are a developer and interested in helping to code any part of this vision, join our Slack group and attend our weekly development meeting. Finally, if you're an encyclopedist, please get in touch. We'll discuss how you can bring your content or metadata announcing your content into the encyclosphere. <laughs>